Well, it's almost impossible to live without one. It's a necessary addition on many a kitchen wall or fridge. If you are remotely techy, you'll have it on your phone. Or if you prefer the physical version, it's getting to that time of year, you need to get a new one for next year. I'm talking, of course, about a calendar or a diary, a vital tool to navigate a busy world. And as we return to Leviticus this morning, we find chapter 23 is a little bit like God giving his people a calendar, a yearly planner, if you like. And like most calendars that you get nowadays, it comes with special days already pre-included. Feast days, festivals, or to to use the word our Bibles use, convocations, fixed times and gatherings. Verses 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel, say to them, these are the appointed feasts that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. These are my appointed feasts. This is my calendar for you. And there's a very helpful picture that I think should help if you're in in any way remotely visually orientated. This should help in understanding and seeing these feasts that we're going to be thinking about together. Uh, Four of them took place in the spring of the year. Three of them took place in the autumn of the year. So we're going, we have Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Weeks or Pentecost, trumpets, Day of Atonement, and booths or tabernacles. And under them all, undergirding them all, underpinning them all, the weekly Sabbath. The weekly Sabbath. So in total, eight. Four in spring, three in autumn, and weekly Sabbath. And we're going to see these these feasts coming up in this chapter together. And in many ways, friends, these were the original holy days for God's people. The original holidays for God's people. The original church calendar. Now, we have many friends in the wider professing church of Christ today who find their church lives governed by a so-called church calendar. And they observe lots of Numerous holy days. This calendar in Leviticus 23 is different, however. Because it wasn't appointed by the church. It was appointed by God for the church. Twice in the opening four verses we read, These were the Lord's appointed feasts. They were his appointed feasts. And God appointing special days is very different from the people appointing special days. What God appoints is to be engaged in wholeheartedly, but what he has never appointed, at which many in the church has taken upon themselves to engage in, is to be set aside. So this is a divinely appointed calendar. Now, much of what we have here, a lot of these things have just flashed up on the screen. Much of it will will seem difficult for us to understand at first. A lot of it seems extremely obscure and foreign. Uh, However, just as our calendars today, just they they give a sense of life rhythm, a, a pattern of work and rest. So this calendar we're going to be considering gave the people of God in the Old Testament a sense of rhythm to their life. It gave them a pattern to things. And like we've seen with everything in Leviticus so far, it all points in a wonderful way to Christ. The gospel is here. The gospel is here in the feasts of Israel. That's what we want to explore together this morning. And we can't cover them all at length, so we're literally just touching on them in turn together. There's eight of these events on their calendar that we want to consider in turn. So we begin with the first festival, the weekly Sabbath. 
the weekly Sabbath in verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest. A Sabbath of solemn rest. And so in this chapter of eight feasts, eight special events, this is the one, friends, at the head of the list. It stands above the rest, almost as if to say, God's people are not to neglect this day in the midst of the excitement of all the others. This one should not be ignored. And it's set apart from the rest. We thought with the children about odd one out. This is the odd one out. As we're going to see, all the other feasts mentioned, they take place on an annual basis. Not this one. This one, of course, is weekly. Six days of work, one day of rest. Every week of the month. Every month of the year. So in that respect, it's the odd one out. But not does it, it doesn't just stand out because it's weekly, but it stands out too because of its continuity. It's continuity. We're going to see all the other feasts. They cease with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are no longer to be observed. They're part of the ceremonial law. Now, we no longer have today feasts of Passover or unleavened bread or feast of booths, for instance. We don't observe them. But the Sabbath is different, friends. It's, it's the odd one out. It's in a different category. It belongs not to the ceremonial law, but to the moral law. It's in the Ten Commandments. It even goes back further to the creation account when God created the heaven and earth in the space of six days and on the seventh day rested. When we come to the New Testament, Jesus indicates time and again his view of the Sabbath. And at no point does he say it no longer applies. It still exists, the weekly Sabbath. And of course, as we thought with the children, with the resurrection, there's a massive shift with this day. Having been the seventh day of the week, it now becomes the first day of the week. And so we're just quite right to talk about the Christian Sabbath or the Lord's Day. And it's very important we have this straight in our minds, friends, because keeping Sunday special is highly contentious in our world today. Even in the wider church today, it's nearly becoming something of a distinctive principle of our church. So we need to understand, before Christ's death and resurrection, people worked six days and looked forward to the coming day of rest. But now that he's risen, we start with a day of rest and we go and do our six days of work. And it was and is still to be a day of resting from common everyday work. Think of how this would have been received by the Israelites here. They had been slaves in Egypt over 400 years where they had experienced non-stop labor under, under fierce tyranny. They are now no longer under such tyranny. And their Redeemer, through the Sabbath day, provides them with one day of compulsory rest. Compulsory rest. What a blessing that must have been. What a blessing it continues to be. God has given us in our calendars seven and a half weeks of holy day. 52 days in the year when we can press pause on the relentlessness of life. Young people, boys and girls, let me encourage you to learn to love the Lord's day. To delight in the Lord's day. It's the one day of the week where you can close up your books, stop your work. And gather together with the people of God. Don't miss the twin elements we thought with the children. It's not just a workless day. It's a worship day. Rest from work. Time for worship. And I would urge you, friends, all of you, to fix in your minds 
that Sunday, the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath, is the first day of your week. The first day of your week. Sadly, many calendars you'll come across will place at last. Your phone calendar, by default, will place at last. You can change that in the settings. The first day of the week. Orientate the settings of your life so that this is the day from which you build and organize everything else. This is a day from which your whole week flows. This is a day when your heart, your soul gets filled up with the things of God. Build the rhythm of your life, the cadence of your life around the Lord's day. Rest on it. Use it to gather with his people. And actually, this is one of the main reasons we have an evening service here. It's one of the main reasons we have an evening service. So that we have opportunity to get the most, the best out of this day. And if you haven't been in practice of coming to our evening service, that's something I would encourage you to do. So that it helps in giving the whole of the day over to the Lord. Don't just come in the morning and then just fritter away the rest of the day. Just lose the rest of the day. Consider it a day of holy gathering, the weekly Sabbath. The rest we'll spend less time on. Secondly, the feast of Passover. The feast of Passover, verse 5. Now we're into the seven annual feasts. The feast of Passover, uh, the first four, if you remember, took place in spring, uh, the next three The last three in autumn. We're in the spring feasts here with Passover. And the feast of Passover is probably the most well known of the lot. Verse 5. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And it was a celebration of that night when the people of God in Egypt sacrificed a lamb, painted its blood over the doors of their houses, And the angel of death passed over the Passover. And God calls his people with this annual meal, this annual feast, to celebrate that night, to relive it, to rehearse their deliverance. And every year, Jewish families had this night where all their focus was on the Passover lamb. Of course, in the New Testament, right from the start of John's gospel, We have John the Baptist saying of our Lord, John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Paul later, 1 Corinthians 5, he goes further by describing Christ as our Passover Lamb. Christ is our Passover Lamb. So this feast, friends, we should give thanks to God for Jesus, our Passover lamb. The lamb who died in our place, suffered our judgment, shed his blood that we might be saved. The Passover feast. But no sooner was the feast of Passover observed than the people observed the next, the feast of unleavened bread. Thirdly, the feast of unleavened bread. Verses 6 to 8. This feast was very closely connected to Feast of Passover. So closely connected that our church Bibles merge the two into the same paragraph. Uh, There it is in verse 6. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This feast took place the day after Passover. So Passover took place sundown Thursday into Friday. Uh, The Feast of Unleavened Bread took place the next day, Saturday, uh, which of course was their Sabbath. That was their Sabbath, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And for the whole week that followed Passover night, they had this festival where all the bread they ate had no yeast in it, unleavened bread. And it reminded them of that night in Egypt again, when they had to eat in haste, they couldn't, have, they couldn't wait for the bread to rise. And we know in time that the people also added to this feast 
uh, by removing every trace of yeast or leaven from their homes at this feast of unleavened bread. And there was a whole charade about this. And, and they had to remove every trace of leaven. And to this day, Orthodox Jews meticulously do this in preparation. We actually get our phrase, spring clean, from that background. Uh, removing every trace of yeast or leaven. Uh, in the New Testament, of course, yeast and leaven is often used in a figurative sense for something sinful, a corrupting sinful influence. Jesus warned his disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees or the leaven of the Sadducees. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 5. Let us celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. As we think of our Lord fulfilling this, Jesus, he's not only the perfect Passover lamb, he's the perfect bread of life, friends. The perfect bread of life without any trace of the leaven of sin, without any hint of evil in him. He's the one who both sustains us, sanctifies us, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But then we come to the next, the Feast of First Fruits, verses 9 to 14, the Feast of First Fruits. This one again runs hot on the heels of the previous two. And actually, these three feasts Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits they all took place over one amazing weekend. One mega weekend that they came together and had these feasts. You'll see verse 11. This feast of first fruits took place on the day after the Sabbath. So that is the day after the start of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It started on a Sabbath. So the day after, uh, what we now know as Sunday, the first day of a new week, they had the Feast of first fruits. The Feast of first fruits, And as the name suggests, this feast marks the beginning of harvest. The priest would take a bundle of the new grain and wave it before the Lord. It was a statement to the people. All they had, everything they got, came from the Lord. It was a celebration of his provision. But more than that, more than that, the Feast of first fruits. It was a way of acknowledging more harvest would come. More would follow. The very word first fruits implies there's going to be further fruits. There's going to be further fruits. It's a promise of more. And the New Testament picks up on this imagery numerous times, friends. Nowhere more significant than when the Apostle Paul describes the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Isn't that wonderful? He's the first fruits of all who would fall asleep, all who would rise from the dead. His resurrection is the first of many that will follow. It's the promise of more that will follow. It's the first, but it won't be the last. The feast of first fruits. So the people having gathered in Jerusalem for this trio of spring festivals, uh, they would then return home. Uh, they had a harvest to do after all. They've just brought the first fruits. They have a lot of harvest now to do. The rest needed brought in. So they've gone for the spring festivals. They returned home for harvest. But in a matter of weeks, they'll be back again for the next. Which is called, fifthly, the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks, verses 15 to 22. The Feast of Weeks. So seven days and one day. Sorry, seven weeks and one day. After the feast of first fruits, God calls for another 
feast, another festival. Uh, Fifty days after first fruits. It's worth noting this too fell on the day after a Sabbath. It fell on a Sunday. There's lots of anticipations actually in these feasts that the first day of the week is going to become important for the people of God. The first day of the week is going to become significant. The Feast of Weeks began on the first day of a week after a Sabbath. Uh, The overwhelming imagery in this feast is one of fullness, abundance, joyfulness. Verse 17 describes every household providing two loaves of baked bread. Imagine that. How many loaves must that have been? They had to provide every home two loaves of baked bread. We're asking for one dozen tray bags or biscuits. They're asking for two loaves from every home. Uh, and they were, they were risen. They, they had yeast uh, in uh, these loaves. Uh, it's all about abundance, this Feast of Weeks. It was an occasion to give thanks, to celebrate the completion of the harvest. It's all been gathered in. And the people have come together to celebrate and rejoice. And the phrase 50 days is where we get our word Pentecost, friends. We sometimes call this feast the Feast of Pentecost. That's what it literally means, 50th. And of course, in the New Testament, 50 days after the ultimate first fruit Sunday, the ultimate first fruit Sunday, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, Acts 2 tells us people from all over have gathered in Jerusalem on the Lord's day, first day of the week. Peter's preaching. It's the Feast of Weeks. It's the Feast of Pentecost. What happens? God blesses the church with the abundance of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down and 3,000 of them are converted. There's an ingathering of souls that day, a huge harvest. And it gives us joyful confidence, friends. It marks an age and a stage when the Holy Spirit through the church is harvesting souls. Jesus himself said, the fields are white on the harvest. We should rejoice in that. We live in an age when God is bringing in an abundant harvest through the power of his spirit. So the Feast of Weeks. Back to the calendar. Following this Feast of Weeks, there's a four-month gap in the calendar. Between spring and autumn now, a four-month gap before the next three feasts. All of them take place in the autumn months. So let's think sixthly, The Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. Verses 23 to 25. Of course, the notable feature of this event is the inclusion of trumpets. Trumpets had to be blown. Trumpets were used in the days of Moses for various reasons. They were used to call people to battle. They were used to announce the presence of the Lord. Uh, Think of Mount Sinai and there was a trumpet call. They were also used to call a meeting. If you heard the trumpet calling, you knew it was time to gather together. We also know on the first day of every month, the trumpet was sounded. It was a way of reminding people, new month. This is a new month. We've, We've moved the trumpet signs. But on the first day of the seventh month, which is what this one is in, it was very special. The seventh month was very significant to the people. The whole day, first day of the seventh month, was punctuated with trumpet blasts. The seventh month was regarded by the Jews as the civil new year. Uh, It was the trumpet announcing blasting It was really announcing new things. New things. We're in a new month, a new civil year. There's a newness. Of course, when we get to the New Testament, there's trumpet blasts mentioned, aren't there? We're told by both Jesus and the apostles that the return of Christ 
will be announced by a trumpet blast. Jesus, in Matthew 24, verse 31, He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. They will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. A day will come, friends, on the calendar. An hour will come, a minute will come, when life as we know it will come to a shuddering halt, and a trumpet blast will break into this world, and Jesus will return. We don't know when that day will be. But it is more certain than any of the special events and days on our calendars. It is more certain than any of the plans on your calendars. The day of the final trumpet call. And it will be the beginning, not just of a new year, but of a whole new creation. The new heavens, the new earth. Are you ready for that trumpet call, friends? Are you prepared for the coming of Christ? The feast of trumpets. Ten days after that feast, the people observed another day. This very, very special day, our seventh one The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, verses 26 to 32. We spent a whole week uh, considering this day back in chapter 16. We don't need to labor the details, I trust. A very solemn day. This was a day that wasn't marked by joyfulness and celebration in the calendar. It was very serious. Uh, Two goats involved in this day, if you remember... Two goats, one sacrificed on the altar, its blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. The other became the scapegoat. And the high priest laid his hands on its head, confessed the sins of the nation over it, and sent it out into the wilderness. It was driven out of the camp. And there's, you might have noticed a a lovely order uh, to these calendar feasts and festival friends. There's a beautiful sequence uh, to all these events as we think of how they relate to Christ. Uh, Passover and unleavened bread, uh, they point so clearly to the cross. Feast of first fruits takes us to the resurrection. The feast of weeks, uh, the feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, there's a beautiful order, sequence. And while this day of atonement does take us back to the cross in a, in a wonderful way, it also is a forward-looking dimension too. We could say with this day of atonement, it's pointing forward to a day when all traces of sin will be utterly removed. Think of that scapegoat heading out of the camp on the day of atonement, taking with it the sin of the people. And not perfectly, of course, but pictorially, uh, their sin being taken away. It seems to me, and God, including the Day of Atonement, at this point in the calendar, he's pointing forward in part to the full and final removal of sin. Right now, the penalty of our sin has been paid for, but we're all too aware of the continued presence of sin. But a day is coming When the trumpets blast and Christ returns and he will remove sin completely. He will eradicate it altogether. And he will renew, remake this universe so that it's sin free. It'll be sin free. Some of us are gluten free. Some of us like to be 
uh, free from all other things and other sorts of things, a day is coming when he will make the world sin free. We can hardly imagine it. How could we? All we've known is a world with sin, but a day is coming and it will be a world without sin. The feast, the day of atonement. Lastly then, the feast of booths. The feast of booths or tabernacles. Verses 33 to 43. This feast was the last of the annual festivals. It was a great celebration to cap them all off. It was a festival that involved camping, actually. If, if you enjoy camping, you would have loved this festival. You would have loved the Feast of Tabernacles. It was basically a seven-day family holiday where you set up a tent or a booth and you lived in it for a full week. And it was again to remind people of their history, to remind them of the 40 years they spent in the wilderness uh, as pilgrims traveling to the promised land. The time would come when they eventually reached that promised land and they would settle in, in houses and homes. They would put down roots, as it were. But, but God never wanted them to forget the times they lived in tents. So he gave them this annual reminder, seven days, when they would live in tents, a reminder that they didn't belong in this world. A reminder that the promised land, Canaan, wasn't yet home. They were still just pilgrims passing through. How wonderfully this speaks to us, friends, as Christians. We need to remember our life here is not the forever life. Our life here is a pilgrimage. It is so easy to just fall in with everyone else and settle down. Put down our roots and think this is our forever home. Sometimes we use that phrase, don't we? Forever home. Nowhere here is our forever home. We need to remember that until Christ returns, we're not yet home. We're not yet home. We should hold loosely to the things of this world. Right now, we are tent living. We're tent living. Any camper among us will tell you, tent living, while it has its upsides, it's not, it's not always easy, tent living. There's downsides to it. Nor is it always easy for the believer. Tent living. It brings with it sickness and sorrow and sadness. Tent living. There, there's change and there's decay. There's aging. There's death. That's all part of tent living. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 actually describes our body as a tent. He speaks of our body as a tent. Not terribly glamorous or attractive. But our bodies are as tents. Some of us, we maybe feel that the fabric is wearing away day by day. But when Jesus returns, we can rejoice, friends, because tent life will be over. Tent life will be over. Must have been a great day for the families and the days of the Old Testament. Lots of excitement, I'm sure, in going to the booths, but... I'm sure by the end they were ready for tent life to be over. I'm sure they were delighted to go back to their homes. Will it not be the same for us when tent life is finally over and we're given new resurrection bodies and we'll finally be in our forever home when it will be really and truly heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. No need for calendars then. No need for diaries then. In the words of John Newton, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praises than when we first begun. 
Amen.